Oh, can people hear me? Awesome. OK, thank you. I'm not going to repeat what I just said because it's not that important. But uh, anyway, yeah, so I've, I've been at LinkedIn for uh, close to five years. Um, I really like it there. Uh, you should come up and talk to me afterwards about working at LinkedIn because I think it's a great place. I might add that uh, Sid here is a LinkedIn alum. Chris, who uh, kindly scheduled this meetup, is a LinkedIn alum. I overlapped with them. Um, and uh, I actually was asking Chris about some LinkedIn history, which is kind of relevant to this presentation, which I will discuss later. Um, so, I'm. <laughs> no, 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 I think Chris fixed a bug in my presentation, which is, uh, which is even better. Um, so, the title of this presentation is Exploiting the Data Code Duality with Dolly, which sounds very metaphysical, but I'm going to try to make it more concrete uh, and explain the problems we're trying to solve. But first, I want to start with talking about Conway's Law. Some of you have probably heard of this before, um, and I'm going to break one of the core rules of giving presentations and read this aloud. So, there's this quote, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So I think I first heard this back when I was in college, and there are a lot of different versions of this quote floating around, and I think the one that I heard is that uh, organizations which design systems uh, are sort of fated to design systems that basically mirror their org chart, which doesn't, sounds even worse, right? And I was a young punk at the time, and I thought, oh, I mean, this is just, you know, all about the dysfunction of corporate America, and that's very dismal. Uh, but you know, that's, that's not uh, an issue for me. Um, and then years later, I went and I actually found the source of the quote, which is a paper that was published in 1968, uh, written by this guy named Melvin Conway. Uh, it was published in a, a journal called Datamation, which is you know, one of those like 1960s era uh, names. Uh, and the paper in many ways is definitely a product of the times. Um, it starts with this great title, How Do Committees Invent? You know, of course, design by committee is now a pejorative, but at the time, this was a very, uh, you know, unfunny question to ask. Um, Conway gives lots of hypothetical examples, which all center on uh, companies uh, trying to design large weapon systems uh, and the problems they encounter. Um, he talks about uh, interfaces, but he has to define that term uh, because it's not in you know, common use at the time. Uh, and he uh, also comments on the recent appearance of companies that only write software uh, and you know what that means uh, for the industry. It's a short paper, it's only four pages long. I'd really recommend uh, digging it out. It's fun to read, if for no other fact than, than you know, just the things that I mentioned. But, um, and I think also like sort of all great papers, uh, many of the points that Conway makes, you know, with, with 50 years of history between now and then, they almost seem obvious to us, or at least some of them do. But I think at the time this was really uh, sort of next level uh, thinking. So anyway, there's this quote. Uh, when I read the paper, though, I realized that there's a lot more to it than that. And in fact, the paper really isn't so much about the dysfunction of management structures as it is about the importance of communication uh, within organizations that are building things and how communication structures then are reflected in the systems that are built. So Conway makes this other interesting observation, which is that the structures of large systems tend to disintegrate during development qualitatively more so than with small systems. And I think the, the lesson you can draw from that is divide and conquer, right? Keep dividing things until you get to a point where they can be managed by a team, where the communication channels remain intact, uh, and the, some of the parts will be better than the mess that's created by a bunch of people all yelling at each other uh, in a confused fashion. But then there are a couple of corollaries. So one is a design effort should be organized according to the need for communication. And he follows that by saying, because the design which occurs first is almost never the best possible, the prevailing system concept may need to change. Therefore, flexibility of organization is important to effective design. So recently, I think it's become pretty trendy uh, in uh, books and blog posts about microservices to reference this paper. Uh, and say, well, you know, Conway basically was predicting uh, the need for microservices. And he was also saying that you have to align your management structures, your team structures with the services that people are building. So that means that really we should be in this constant state of reorganization, right? We should do a reorg every week or every month. Uh, and we have to, you know, be flexible uh, and focus on the software and craftsmanship and not worry too much about the fact that we no longer have the same boss uh, from week to week or the same teammates. Um, that's one way to look at it, but I actually 
in a way, don't think that's what Conway was saying. There's this other part of the paper, which to me is the really important part. So Conway makes this prediction in the conclusion where he says that it becomes necessary to restrict communication so that people can get work done. And earlier in the paper, he notes that uh, if you have a graph of nodes, where nodes are, of course, people, uh, and you look at all of the edges, it's, it's proportional to basically n squared over 2, right? So that's a lot of chattering happening between people. So we have these structures that emerge where you try to uh, limit communication or, let's say, consolidate communication so that people aren't constantly jabbering at each other. But he says that research which leads to techniques permitting more efficient communication among designers will play an extremely important role in the technology of system management. And I think, to me, that over the last 50 years, a lot of the advances in software development and software development tooling have actually been all about making communication between software developers more efficient. So what, what are some of the things that are required for efficient communication, in particular, efficient communication about change? Because that's what people designing big systems are talking about, right? Conway mentioned that the original design is never the right design. The design is constantly changing. You need to be able to communicate these changes and negotiate these changes uh, efficiently. So one thing is clear protocols. Uh, how do I negotiate a request for a change with the person who I want to make the change? Do I send them an email? Do I file a JIRA against them? Uh, I'm a very sort of nervous and anxious person, and I frequently get worried just wondering, like, what's the right way to like reach out to this person, right? I don't want to look like a fool. Uh, maybe Jira is the right way, maybe an email is the right way. How do I, how do I ask for this? You also want a communication mechanism which is high fidelity. So what I think I'm saying is what the other person actually hears. You want to maintain a high signal to noise ratio. Uh, if I send out an email blast every day saying, attention, uh, you know, most people are going to stop reading it even when it applies to them, because most of the time it doesn't. So making sure that things are targeted is very important. And finally, compression. So I can liken this to saying that uh, uh, some programming languages, right, have the quality of compression in the sense that it's possible to express more with less. So Lisp and Haskell, right, are languages that benefit from high compression. Assembly language has very low compression. Uh, and being able to express things succinctly uh, is definitely an advantage here, right? Because it takes less time. So I mentioned microservices earlier, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how Conway's law, I think, applies to microservices, and in particular, the communication angle here. And I'm going to do that by talking about the history of the evolution of LinkedIn's site-serving infrastructure. So version one of LinkedIn, which you can think of as like proto LinkedIn, uh, basically consisted of one giant application and one giant Oracle database. And the name of this application is Leo. Uh, I was going to say that that stands for LinkedIn Engineering Organization because the entire organization was working on this thing. But uh, Chris just informed me that actually Leo is the name of the developer who originally developed this, uh, which is, I think, a lesson why you shouldn't name software after yourself because the rallying cry quickly became Kill Leo uh, at LinkedIn. So version two, uh, in order to cope with uh, scaling demands, uh, some other services were created. There was a cache basically for the member graph. Uh, you couldn't keep hitting the main database, so there was a change data capture mechanism, sort of a prototype of data bus, which relayed to replica DBs. And you know, the situation just became worse. Leo kept growing. The, the sort of like services running in this one giant code base kept increasing. Um, it was one giant repo. The build broke every day. Uh, it took probably an hour to build this, so every developer had a giant beefy tower next to their desk, maybe sometimes two, so that they could chain builds together. Uh, and I think around, did correct me if I'm wrong, like 2009, maybe, people said, we need to fix this problem. Uh, is that, am I right about that? Yeah, 2009, okay. Yeah, six, and that's in 2009, right? So uh, these, were, these were pretty cool. And they still have them, even though I don't think people really need them. So I have two of them right now, which I mine Bitcoin on. Uh, so anyway, here's the site architecture today. So it is a microservice architecture. There's a front end tier, a mid tier, and a back end tier. Um, there were pieces of infrastructure that were built to enable this. And two of the most important that I want to talk about are Restly and multi-product. So Restly uh, is basically 
I'm going to call it an RPC mechanism, but I know that people who designed Restly keep saying that Restly is not RPC, but to me it is. Uh, I, I'm not going to debate that, but uh, what does Restly consist of? Well, there is a service discovery layer, uh, which makes it easy to find services and also to deploy services uh, to new data centers. There is a way of describing services, what their schema or interface is, uh, using something called the Pegasus, uh, Pegasus language. Um, there are rules and processes that govern how interfaces can change over time uh, and how backwards compatibility should be maintained. Uh, and there's also an interesting feature called Deco, which allows you to sort of generate synthetic services uh, built on top of other services and define them in a very lightweight manner. So you could think of it as like service fusion or data fusion. And all of this rests on top of multi-product, which is this really great uh, tooling and software development infrastructure that our tools team built. Um, so they've created a nice integration between many open source components, things like review board and Git, uh, and the um, integration and testing layers. Uh, there's also really nice dependency tracking. So it's not possible just to declare a dependency, but there's also a database of dependencies. You can ask questions like, who depends on me? Uh, and you can ask questions like, uh, who do I depend on and what are all the transitive dependencies that flow out of it? And this is great for impact analysis because who depends on me is also sort of a way of saying, who am I going to break uh, when I make this change? And it's also a way of asking uh, who broke me uh, when something bad happens. Um, and finally, there's a lot of nice uh, deployment tooling, which makes it very easy to take a change, uh, pass it through integration testing, and then finally click a button and have it uh, deployed to the data centers. So way down at the right-hand corner of this diagram, you see Kafka and you see Hadoop. And this is mostly what I'm going to talk about in, in the next part of the presentation. Um, they just appear as boxes here, but for me, this is my entire world. This is the offline side of LinkedIn. Uh, and basically, you have a bunch of services which are constantly emitting event data. You know, every time someone clicks on a site there's, or clicks on a button, there is an event. Uh, every time someone updates a database, that eventually gets uh, published to Kafka and through Goblin ingested into HDFS. And all of this data, you know, arrives in our data lake. Um, and that, uh, you know, causes problems because while there is all of this great tooling and process uh, and mechanisms for communicating about change on the online side, none of this existed uh, on the offline side. The offline side was a completely separate world. And one of the main problems is that for people generating data on the online side, they had no idea where it was going. Uh, and people on the offline side frequently didn't really know where the data that they were getting was coming from or who to contact when it changed. So it was a scenario where really people were just putting messages in bottles and throwing them out. Uh, and eventually, sort of the irony is, this data would then get published back to the site. Uh, but, you know, that's not to ask questions about how that was happening. So, you know, it was a sort of fact of life that things were constantly breaking. And people were spending more and more and more time every day uh, responding to these issues. Um, it was pretty common to have fire drills on the weekend. Uh, Jeff, you know, the, the CEO of LinkedIn at the time, um, like to start every morning with a cup of coffee uh, and a spreadsheet of metrics. Uh, and if you send an email out at 9 a.m. saying, why does this metric look off? Then you'd have this long email thread of people saying, okay, I've traced it back to here. And it especially sucked when that was on a weekend uh, and you would spend 24 hours trying to track something like that down. So um, the, the changes that were made on the online side enabled uh, an explosion in the number of services. I think by 2010, there were about 900 uh, microservices running, and each of these services were emitting different uh, events, which then led to an explosion in the number of data sets uh, on HDFS on the offline side. Um, and there was, you know, just fundamentally this disconnect uh, between the online and offline side of the world. So one of the, the big problems, right, was there was no real communication channel between data producers and data consumers, and the uh, ability that people on the online side had to define contracts between them and their clients didn't really exist uh, offline. You had no idea who depended on a data set. Uh, you had no way of notifying them about a change. You had no way of knowing if a change would uh, break them. So we ended up in this mess where there was just a cloud of uncertainty uh, sitting between uh, you know, us and basically everyone else. And it was you know, a real hell. Uh, 
So what we started to think about was ways of taking uh, the things that we had seen proven to work in the online side and basically uh, porting them over to the offline side. So to start with, we were looking at data sets. Uh, and we started to realize that data sets have both an implementation and an interface. And the fact that these weren't uh, cleanly decoupled was causing a lot of problems. So uh, when people were reading data sets offline, they had to manage a lot of details, very few of which were actually relevant to the process of extracting records from a data set. So they had to know the physical path and the cluster that a data set resided on. They had to know how the data set was partitioned in terms of file organization and layout and directories. They had to know the serialization format, whether it's Avro or binary JSON or God knows what. Uh, and they also had to know the schema. And really the schema was the only thing that they should need to care about because that is the interface or the API of the data set. So we uh, you know, investigated mechanisms of separating uh, those two things out. And I think we, we designed or basically leveraged uh, ideas taken from H catalog uh, and Hive. I should probably mention that um, before LinkedIn, I spent uh, a lot of time working at Cloudera where I focused primarily on Hive and other SQL engines. And before that, uh, I worked at uh, Oracle where I met some of my other colleagues. Um, and I think sort of the, the database model uh, has been um, sort of a real touchstone for me. Uh, the level of abstraction that it provides, the way that it separates uh, physical data from the logical view of data uh, and the way that it allows you to cleanly separate those things I think have been very influential for me uh, which is one of the reasons why when Hadoop first became popular uh, at the same time when um, you know NoSQL was very popular a lot of people saw Hadoop as kind of the anti-SQL or the anti-database uh, and then sort of ironically it seems like over the last 10 years Hadoop has started to look more and more and more like a database in the good ways uh, namely this nice abstract model uh, and not in the bad ways, uh, you know, where it doesn't scale or you have to wait to load your data before you can read it. So uh, another observation we made is the data sets in many ways look like services. Um, so they're maintained by someone else, which is a great thing, right? You don't want to maintain every service yourself. Uh, people locate them using some kind of discovery service and they have a mostly well-defined API. So I mentioned that, you know, change was a problem for us. Uh, so the next question to ask is how do uh, online services manage change? Well, one way, as I mentioned, is that they have a well-defined process for the sorts of changes that you are allowed to make and how downstream consumers are notified of those changes. Like, for example, adding a new field uh, to a schema or to an interface is going to cause a version bump. And bumping a version is really a way of telling a client or someone who depends on it that something has changed. You need to go and look at this, right? And a major version bump conveys, well, this is a backward incompatible change. When you make that with an online service, you basically then provide two APIs, the old API version one and the new API version two. With data sets on HDFS, we don't have that luxury unless we want to create two copies of the data set, one with the new schema and one with the old schema. That's pretty costly. Uh, and since we often run at like 80 or 90% of capacity, I'm not even sure that we could do that. We would have enough space for it. So, you know, like I mentioned, we had all of these issues. Uh, in addition, we also had uh, issues with uh, code reuse. Um, logic that people would use on the online side uh, could be applied to the offline side if we just had a mechanism for doing that. Um, sharing schemas between online and offline makes a lot of sense. Sharing a catalog of data sets between online and offline would make a lot of sense. Um, so the, the, the notion then of viewing data sets as microservices emerged. And the next step then was to think, well, how can we actually sort of insert a function between the data set and the client? So if you're familiar with SQL, if you're familiar with databases, you've probably heard of views before. And a view is basically a function defined in terms of a SQL query, which generates something that looks like a table. And that's you know, precisely what we needed here. The only question was, how do you support views uh, when you have sort of a polyglot environment where people are running pig and hive and scalding and cascading and who knows what else? I think you know, LinkedIn has always been very uh, open about people arriving and evangelizing a new tool. Uh, and that's both good and bad. I mean, it's good in the sense that people get to use new things and benefit from new things. It's bad in the sense that uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So, uh, 
we started by basically saying that let's create a table abstraction on top of uh, files on HDFS. Let's hide the physical details like format uh, and partitioning scheme. And we can use the meta store that Hive provides to do that. Um, I often like to say that, you know, I think the, the most important part of Hive is not the SQL engine, it's really the meta store. Uh, and if you're familiar with like the Hadoop ecosystem, the meta store has really become the de facto uh, metadata service uh, for Hadoop. Um, every other sort of like SQL on Hadoop engine that came after Hive in order to be relevant had to integrate with it because people already had data stored in Hive. Um, so then the next thing was to talk about views and uh, with a dolly view, which is the sort of abstraction that we came up with, uh, we bundle the ability to define a view also with the ability to define dependencies on UDFs uh, as well as other views and to track these as software artifacts. So with multi-product and that tooling, you already have the ability to say this jar depends on these jars. With Dolly views, we have the ability to say this function or this view depends on these other functions or views. Uh, it depends on these UDFs uh, and it also depends on these schemas. So that makes then impact analysis very easy or it makes it possible at least uh, where you can try to figure out you know, what the implication of making a change would be. So this gives you an example uh, or a, a sort of a taste for what uh, Dolly views look like. Um, this particular view is one of the first ones that we created one of the original motivations uh, for building this functionality. Um, we had this big data set uh, called the identity super block which basically provides profile information for everyone on LinkedIn. And the, the data set was very deeply nested. I think eight levels of nesting per record. And for tools like Pig and Hive, they don't provide great semantics for accessing very nested data. So we were once again forced into the situation of, well, what do you do? Do you create two copies of ISD, one flattened and one nested? Do you say, hey, here's a UDF. Uh, which will flatten ISB, and then you end up with, I don't know, N copies of it, right? One for Spark, one for Hive, one for Cascading and Spalding and Pig, and you have to keep pushing these out and having people update uh, as you make changes? Or do you basically push all of this logic into a view and have people depend on the view instead? And that's the solution that we ended up going with. And I think the another sort of important thing to recognize about views are that views, um, enable code sharing in a centralized fashion. So there's only one source of truth for what the definition of that view is at any given point in time. If you want to basically push out a new version, you can do that and everyone is affected. You don't have to worry about uh, people who are slow to upgrade or things like that. So everyone gets a consistent view of the view. So how did we do this? Um, so we basically hacked Hive. We uh, created uh, reader libraries, one for pig, one for spark, one for uh, scalding and cascading, which embed uh, the Hive execution engine inside of the client reader. And because we did it this way, views also have some limitations. So we don't allow aggregations, we don't allow joins, uh, because those trigger reduce operations. So this is a purely map side operation. Um, and while that seems like you know, a pretty significant uh, limitation. I think one of the things that surprised me or consistently surprised me has been how useful views turn out to be even with these limitations. You can still do filtering, you can still do unions, uh, you can still do uh, record by record transformations, and you can even do joins as long as you basically do it in a map side fashion. So this particular example shows uh, the uh, reader being used to uh, read a view which unions together uh, two different tables, in effect creating a synthetic table. So after we, uh, you know, sort of satisfied this initial use case of ISB, we started to realize that views, uh, even if they only, you know, can do map side operations, are useful for a lot of other things as well. I wanted to quickly run through some of those. So like I mentioned, you can flatten or nest uh, data. You can demultiplex uh, data sets which have been effectively materialized as unions uh, into uh, separate virtual tables. Uh, you can also go in the reverse direction where you create a synthetic union out of multiple things that have been materialized individually. Um, at LinkedIn, right now, we have this one giant data set called um, page view events, which basically tracks every time someone views a page. The thing is though, it's in effect a materialized union of like a thousand different uh, event types. And if you look at the queries that people run against, and every single query is basically 
select from page view events where event type equals whatever. So there are a lot of full table scans, which are completely unnecessary. And if this was represented instead as a union, uh, we would be able to optimize uh, that away completely. And then I think the, the most important point for me is that uh, views allow us to basically manage making backward incompatible changes, which up to this point had not really been possible, simply because to make a backward compatible change or a backward incompatible change, you had to create and manage two copies of data. You had no real way of tracking uh, the progress of people migrating from the old version to the new version, so you never really knew when it was complete. Um, you had uh, no real communication mechanism for coaxing people off of one to the other. Um, but with views, we're able to basically uh, create a view on top of the old data set with the new schema, give people a chance to migrate to that, and then deprecate the old one. And this also makes the change asynchronous. So it gives people the ability to migrate uh, in an incremental fashion. So it's not a stop the world change uh, as it would be otherwise. And that I think is fundamental to reducing the cost of change and really making change possible. I mentioned code reuse earlier, and I think that's another important point. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to share logic with everyone and make sure that everyone is using the same logic. And that has been a major problem for us up to that point. Um, versioning, of course, like I said, allows us to replace push upgrades with incremental pulls. Um, and then in the future, one of the things that we really want to uh, investigate is um, doing optimizations where we basically view uh, views as a graph of views, model them as a giant common table expression, and throw it at the optimizer and say, you know, make of it what you will. Because I think anyone who looks at the jobs that run on our clusters on a daily basis knows that there's a lot of redundant work happening. There are a lot of scans of the same table over and over again. People are doing the same joins over and over again. Uh, so the ability to uh, see logic which is visible to the optimizer and to rewrite it uh, is, I think, sort of the, the end goal for us in many ways. So what is Dolly? Uh, it is a data model in the sense that we have an abstraction for data sets, and data sets can be either a materialized table or they can be a virtual view. Uh, and we have libraries that allow you to extract structured records from them. It is a data registry and catalog, uh, which allows people to uh, use a single namespace to identify data sets across multiple clusters. Um, it is a uh, portable data access layer, so you're not limited to one tool to access data. Uh, and then since it integrates with uh, the, the tool development chain that our tools team provides. Uh, it's also now a tool chain that connects data producers to data consumers. So we have dependency tracking. You can see who is consuming your data set offline. You can see where your data comes from online. Uh, and this has made uh, the weekend fire drills uh, largely a thing of the past. So I think another interesting thing about Dolly is that it gives you the ability to move seamlessly between physical and virtual data sets. And that's, I think, one of the really interesting things about SQL and this abstraction in general, that something uh, that is a table one day can be a view the next day. Uh, and this um, you know, gives us the ability to, in some cases, replace data with logic and vice versa. And that's the duality uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's uh, major for code reuse, the last time I mentioned that, and dependency management. So, um, last point I'll make is that it is uh, format and storage agnostic. Uh, I think shortly before I arrived at LinkedIn, um, people had started to notice that uh, having lots and lots of different data formats really sucked. Uh, there was Avro, there was JSON, there was binary JSON, CSV, TSV, and God knows what else. Uh, and it made it very hard to uh, share data with other people. Um, so the solution to that was, let's just make everything Avro. Uh, but then the problem became Avro, uh, because as soon as we made that conversion, a lot of new and better formats emerged like ORC and Parquet. Uh, so, you know, we sort of quickly realized that uh, you actually really want to be format agnostic. Uh, and users shouldn't need to care what the format is anyway. So by providing basically format agnostic reader libraries, we're able to provide that separation between the underlying physical details and the logical view that uh, users require. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how we have streamlined communication uh, between producers and consumers, and in particular, about how you negotiate changes. So 
um, one of the problems with data sets in the past was that schemas frequently were not really good enough to specify the actual interface of a data set. We were constrained to these raw physical types like string or big int uh, or things like that. Um, and you know, a string, for example, can be a URI uh, or it can be uh, a token in an enumeration, but there was no way to express this. Uh, and it made it very hard for consumers to depend uh, on these facts, um, even if it was the intention of the data set producer uh, to maintain that constraint. Um, similarly, relationships between uh, different fields uh, in a data set were not possible to express. Um, there were multiple cases where uh, data sets uh, would have uh, a time field, let's say, in milliseconds, and another time field that had been added later in seconds. Uh, people would get confused about which was which, uh, and that would then cause uh, metrics to, to skew one day. Um, so we really wanted a, a more refined mechanism, a more explicit mechanism for specifying what these contracts are. And I think you know, we can sort of learn a lot from, from law and lawyers uh, in terms of what makes a contract good. Like a good contract is easy to find. Uh, it's easy to understand both for the people writing it as well as for the people uh, agreeing to it. And it's easy to change. And uh, you know, complicated contracts, vague contracts, hard to understand contracts are good for lawyers. They're generally not good uh, for you and me or for organizations that depend on them. So um, we wanted to uh, introduce you know, this better contract negotiation mechanism, but that also involved then introducing a new process. And I think we're all familiar as engineers, software engineers with bike shedding. You, know, you propose a design, uh, and people come, they say, well, you know, you could change it a little bit. Here's a suggestion. It just goes on endlessly. Uh, I can tell you that proposing a process is 10 or 100 times worse. Because the first thing people hit you with is, I don't think we even need this process. Things are good the way they are. You're a petty bureaucrat. Go away. Uh, and I think, I think it's understandable in the sense that, that humans um, are very good at feeling immediate pain but they're very bad at connecting their actions with pain uh, that they experience 10 days later. And even more to the point, um, if I do something that causes you pain, but it makes life easier for me and I don't know you, uh, chances are I'm going to go ahead and happily do that, right? So, so it, you know, it's, it's sort of understandable why asking people to sort of pay a tax up front so that they get, let's say, better things uh, down the road and life is better for everyone, why that's a hard sell. But if you can basically identify a process that the company has already agreed to and say, well, hey, we're just introducing this process, but in this new context, then that's a lot easier. So that's basically what we did uh, with Dolly and with um, offline data management. So um, contract negotiation already existed in the form of review board. You know, I have a change, I want to change your API, I'm going to submit a patch, you, the owner of the code, can either approve or deny it. Uh, if it's approved, then that becomes part of the contract going forward. So by managing the definition of views in Git, uh, we both benefited from um, the sort of software deployment tool chain, but we also benefited from this established process, right? That craftsmanship matters, that there's a way of requesting changes, there's a way to agree to changes. Um, and uh, another benefit of this is that the contract, the way that we uh, give people the ability to specify the contract is also leveraged in the form of data quality tests. So these are basically logical rules, you know, governing uh, what is allowed for a specific column in a table or a relationship uh, between two columns in a table or maybe a relationship between rows. Uh, and by expressing these as basically SQL fragments, we're able to then, as data is ingested, use these to validate the data. We're also uh, in the process of basically taking these rules and pushing them up the pipeline so that we can uh, catch bad data uh, as soon as it arrives. And I think you know, that's one of the, the sort of issues with this infrastructure compared to, let's say, a traditional database where you catch data quality issues on load, right? You can't load it into a table uh, if it doesn't satisfy the schema, but with uh, HDFS and Kafka for that matter, is still very much a schema on read system. So you don't have confidence that uh, the data actually conforms to the schema that you're using to read it otherwise. 
so this gives you an example of the um, the uh, deployment uh, process, the the authoring, uh, reviewing, and uh, deployment process. Uh, we have a, a Gradle plugin, which allows someone to uh, define their view in their Git repository and then also compile it uh, locally against the data sets that are defined in the Metastore, uh, make sure that it compiles uh, and extract a couple of rows from it. Um, we leverage the MP tooling then to basically test the view and then deploy it to Artifactory where it's managed as an artifact. Uh, and then we have um, some deployment tooling built on top of the tooling that Multiproduct gives us to then deploy it to the Metastore catalog. So, you know, we intentionally made this look as much like developing what people think of as software as possible. Um, you know, both in order to leverage the process, but also I think to make this um, more familiar to people on the online side who are already developing software and using this tooling. So, we started with a mess. We ended up with this beautiful uh, system where the cloud uh, was blown away and where the connections binding people together, you know, in harmony are now visible uh, and everything is good. But uh, the next step one then was to sort of think about, uh, well, you know, we, we had this nice abstraction for data sets. Uh, we have this ability now to easily evolve data sets. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if you could define a view but actually evaluate it in other contexts? Uh, we know that uh, all of the data in HDFS at some point starts in Kafka. Uh, in many cases, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the data set in HDFS and a uh, Kafka tracking topic, wouldn't it be nice if we could create what is in effect a synthetic data set, a virtual data set defined as a view and actually uh, use it on top of Kafka? Uh, and you know, that I think uh, makes a lot of sense, especially when you uh, start to think about, well, wouldn't it be nice to have a single name for a data set but be able to consume it in any one of a variety of contexts, both nearline, offline, and potentially offline? So we started to work on uh, Dolly streaming. Um, and the end result was basically the ability to author one of these synthetic data sets, uh, give your clients the ability to access it both uh, nearline and offline, uh, and the ability to leverage a unified catalog uh, spanning these two spheres. And once again, people benefit from the same tooling. So the process then of developing and deploying a view is exactly the same. In the past, uh, in order to develop a uh, Kafka job or a Samza job, it was distinctly different. You used a different API, you used a different deployment mechanism than to deploy the same logic uh, as a workflow or a data set on uh, the offline side. But now these two worlds uh, have converged. Oops. And this gives uh, an example of uh, how we built it. Um, we basically uh, created a Dolly system consumer for Samza. It looks very much like uh, the reader APIs that we've built for these other layers, uh, and still we're using um, Hive as the uh, embedded execution engine. So there were some interesting uh, technical challenges uh, involved in this work. Um, one issue is, you know, what is the sort of the best layer to build on? We thought about building on Kafka directly. Uh, we negotiated with the different teams and it seemed like Samza was the way to go, at least initially. Um, long term, we plan to uh, support both Kafka and Samza. There are also some interesting issues with uh, accessing HDFS files from uh, Samza. So uh, I mentioned earlier that it's possible to do joins in views as long as they are mapped side joins. Uh, and typically people uh, do that using a UDF. So they basically uh, uh, you know, reference a UDF as one of the columns in their view. And that UDF is actually referencing a side data set uh, and doing the join for them in memory. Uh, but you know, this can cause some problems, right? Like, is the UDF actually going to be able to access that cluster from this context? Um, and we're sort of now looking at the way of actually uh, giving people the ability to express joins explicitly, you know, as a join in the SQL, uh, and then translating it on the fly into uh, a UDF when it needs to run uh, on Samza or in some other situation where, um, you know, sort of arbitrary joins are not supported. Uh, checkpointing and partitioning is also sort of another interesting thing. Um, we quickly realized talking to the Kafka and Samza teams that when they said partition, it meant something completely different from what we meant when we said partition. Uh, we think of partitioning a data set basically as how you arrange files uh, on HDFS. They think about partitioning in terms of 
uh, hash partitioning uh, a stream based on a column across different nodes in your Kafka cluster. That took, I think, easily two weeks to resolve uh, before we realized the disconnect there. Um, and now I think the, the thing that we're still sort of working through is, um, you know, since Dolly aspires to be completely logical, right, to completely decouple the logical view uh, that users have from any of the underlying physical details, we're pretty adamant that we don't want to expose uh, the underlying physical Kafka partitions to users or their logic. Uh, Kafka team feels very differently about this. Um, I think we're still looking for the right abstraction to use uh, for that. So I've talked a lot about SQL. I really like SQL. I know that a lot of other people don't like SQL. Uh, I will try to convince you afterwards if you don't like SQL that, uh, you know, come up and talk to me, right? I, I think I can do it. Um, so why is SQL great? Well, for one thing, it's declarative. Uh, and uh, you're expressing intent as opposed to how to do something. Uh, it's strongly typed, uh, which makes a lot of optimizations possible. It is composable. So, you know, one query can depend on another query, can depend on another query. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that you can then actually rewrite uh, queries uh, and you can optimize the rewritten whole. Um, it is optimizable in the sense that it's not opaque uh, to the execution engine, which enables uh, optimizations like filter pushdown uh, or column pruning or partition pruning. Uh, and if you instead, let's say, um, you know, write uh, something in a compiled language, right, then that's just, it's opaque logic, right? The optimizer can't do anything with it. Um, in, uh, in sort of the SQL world, there's this concept of like a, a search argumentable or sargable uh, filter, you know, which is something that the, uh, the execution engine can optimize using an index. Uh, and as soon as you start using compiled languages, sargability uh, goes out the door. Um, another nice thing is that it's compiled at runtime. And I say that's nice because you don't have to worry about binary incompatibilities then. Uh, when we migrated from Hadoop 1 to Hadoop 2 at LinkedIn, it was kind of a rude surprise when we realized that Hadoop 1 and Hadoop 2 are source compatible but binary incompatible because uh, some classes had changed to interfaces which meant that we had to go and ask users to take their code, bump their dependencies, and recompile, but not actually change any of the code, uh, and then redeploy, which sounds really strange, uh, but this is just one of the, the interesting issues with Java. Um, we actually, in some cases, worked around that by building this thing called byte ray, uh, which actually modified the byte code uh, that people had already uh, installed on Asgivan. And we've since then used byte ray for a bunch of other things, like. Um, sort of sanitizing people's dependencies, making sure that they're not including garbage and fat jars that uh, they shouldn't is going to cause class path conflicts. Um, I think I'll just quickly say that like when you realize that like Hadoop and Spark for that matter is like a platform for running binaries provided by other people, uh, you'd think that like there would be better support, right, for binary compatibility and for isolating class paths and things like that. But uh, you know, maybe going back to something I said earlier, it really becomes apparent that the people who have produced these platforms are not the same people who use these platforms, so they don't feel the pain, and these are not problems that they're by and large motivated to solve. I think the other thing I like about SQL is that it's the closest thing we have to sort of a, a lingua franca or Esperanto uh, for data processing, um, although, you know, that does come with some limitations. So, like, what is, what is bad about SQL? I'll skip to the third point here, which is that ANSI SQL is a marketing term. It's not a reality uh, in the sense that people think like, oh, if I'm using something that is ANSI SQL, that means that I can write SQL and then port it as portable from one thing to another. But that's definitely not the case, right? Because every, uh, every SQL engine out there which claims to be ANSI compatible supports ANSI, but it also supports all of these other things. And they try to entice you uh, into using these nice extensions. And as soon as you do, uh, you know, portability goes out the window. Probably also relevant to mention that I think the only database out there that is compatible at level three of the SQL standard is this thing called Mimer SQL, which I don't know anyone who uses that, right? So it kind of gives you an idea of like, I guess, you know, being ANSI compatible is not really the way to win the, the, the war for customers. Um, so what else sucks about SQL? Well, uh, deeply nested queries can be hard to read. A lot of people find writing queries inside out to be kind of counterintuitive. Um, if you're familiar with common table expressions, they eliminate this problem. Common table expressions are really cool, by the way. I encourage everyone to look at them. Uh, but 
uh, I think a lot of people, especially people who come from more of a software development background, really want it to look more imperative, like X equals whatever, B equals whatever. And I think that's one of the reasons why Pig, uh, uh, you know, managed to capture a lot of mind share, claiming to be imperative even when it was actually a declarative language. Um, it's hard to access uh, deeply nested uh, data using sort of ANSI standard syntax. And I think it's interesting if you look at um, some of the systems that have come out of Google where deeply nested data is pervasive uh, and some of the ways that BigQuery and BigQuery language has been modified to provide better semantics for working with nested data. I think the, the industry is moving in that direction, but you know, since most sort of enterprise customers are still dealing with like flat table structures, it will probably be a while uh, before that happens. And then, you know, another problem is you can't express everything in SQL. Uh, frequently, you need to write UDFs, and as soon as you write a UDF, you're dependent on the API of a particular engine, and you no longer have portable code. Uh, and then finally, I think, like, uh, a lot of software engineers, I've noticed, just have this knee-jerk reaction to SQL. Like, that's something that DBAs do. That's not what I do. I'm not going to learn that. Um, I might also add that I think a lot of people, their first taste of SQL is SQL for OLTP, like row level inserts, updates, and deletes, which I think is a lot harder to learn than the SQL which is used uh, on Hadoop, which is more of OLAP SQL, where you're streaming uh, data out of one table through a set of transformations and joins into another table. And when you start to think about it that way, uh, I, th I think it's, it's a lot easier to learn. So we are in the process of solving this problem by creating what we call standard SQL and portable UDFs. So the goal with portable UDFs is to give people the ability to write a UDF once and then to efficiently translate it into platform-specific UDFs for Hive and Pig and Spark. And the goal of standard SQL is to provide both a standard SQL dialect, which we can then compile down to a variety of other target languages, but also to be able to take existing languages like HiveQL or Pig uh, or Spark or Presto and compile those down uh, to a variety of target languages. And we're building this uh, in large part on top of Apache Calcite. If you're not familiar with Calcite, you really have to go and look at this. Uh, it's basically a toolkit for relational algebra. Uh, it's also a toolkit for building databases. Uh, Julian Hyde, the guy who started the project, um, is like a, a database old timer. I think he was on his like fourth optimizer. Uh, when he was like, man, I've been basically writing the same thing over and over again. It would be really cool to sort of take what I've learned over the past 20 years uh, and create a toolkit so that people don't have to, you know, make the same mistakes that I did. Um, there are a lot of other projects that are using Calcite. Uh, I think there are a lot of startups uh, that are going to be based on Calcite. Uh, in my opinion, it's like the single most important uh, Apache project in existence right now. So, um, like I said, take a look at it. So, Really, the, the direction that we're going in with this is to try to decouple these three things that have been tightly coupled up to this point. So I think in some ways, the, the popularity of Hadoop can be explained by the fact that it decoupled storage from the processing engine. In the past, right, your database was tied to storage. Uh, if you loaded data into Oracle, you could only read the data with Oracle. Uh, but with the Hadoop model, you just land the data uh, in HDFS, and you can use a variety of tools uh, to analyze and interpret it. Um, the remaining problem, though, is the logic that you write is still tied to a particular uh, engine. Uh, and, you know, engines come and go, right? Like, Pig was really popular, now it's not popular. Hive was pretty popular, now it's not that popular anymore, or at least, you know, not at LinkedIn. So there's always going to be, like, a new thing, or at least that's been the trend so far. Uh, only a fool would say, like, this is, you know, going to be the thing that we're going to use, you know, forevermore. As soon as you finish migrating into something, usually, like, the new thing has appeared and people are already talking about how to get off of it. Uh, and the larger your organization grows, the more logic that people write, the more expensive those migrations are. So we think it makes sense to invest in actually uh, coming up with ways to decouple uh, the logic from the processing engine and to make things far more portable. I want to leave you with this, this one parting thought. This is something I've been iterating on recently. I wanted to try it out and see what you guys think of it. So um, we have a lot of workflow engines uh, for managing data workflows. There are things like Azkaban or Uzi or Airflow or Luigi. I, 
the list is, I think, twice as long as this. Uh, and you know, fundamentally, these are all engines that allow you to chain uh, DAGs of jobs together. And the interesting thing about this is that these jobs all consume data and they all produce data. So in a way, these workflows are actually views. And if views are virtual data sets, then it stands to reason that we're making this way more complicated than it needs to be. Because now we have a namespace of jobs and we have a namespace of data sets. And what we're really interested in is the data, but we frequently have to map that to the name of a, a job in order to figure out you know, who is producing the data. Wouldn't it be simpler to just have one namespace of data sets where every data set is basically a view, every data set name is connected to the recipe used to create it, and you understand the dependencies. And then when you start thinking about things as a DAG of views, it makes it a lot easier to then think about it, oh, this is just one giant common table expression. Let's just compile this whole thing down, throw it at the optimizer, uh, and let the optimizer make sense of it. So that's, that's my dream. You know, we'll see if we get there. Uh, conclusion, Dolly is great. It's made life easier for us. Everyone should check it out. Uh, we hope to open source it soon. I've been saying that for a long time, but you know, we're really close, uh, so please hang in there. Uh, here's my email address if you want to you know, uh, send me an email you know, about whether you like this talk or if you have any questions. Um, we recently published uh, a blog post about Dolly that I wrote with uh, Vasant uh, sitting over there. He's the manager of the Dolly and Goblin teams at LinkedIn. A very diverse and eclectic guy. Uh, he's fun to talk to. Recommend introducing yourself. Um, there's also a blog post uh, from, I think, five years ago about the service infrastructure at LinkedIn and these different versions of LinkedIn site-facing infrastructure. It's an interesting read, although it leaves out the detail that Leo was the name of the guy who wrote Leo, which I think should really be in there. So anyway, uh, questions? In the back, Chris. You only get one question. Hmm. So um, what we've done is to uh, create what we call producer views. So every tracking topic is now connected to a producer view. Uh, and that basically provides then the public API uh, of that tracking topic. And one of the, the interesting, I think, things about the development of Dolly is that there's an element of like social change uh, that we're trying to affect with this project. So we're trying to make online data producers responsible for their offline data. Uh, so uh, that involved basically uh, creating these producer views uh, for online producers and then going to them and saying, you now own this. Uh, and if you only make backward compatible changes uh, to your schema, this will auto evolve. You don't need to touch it. New versions will get published. Downstream consumers will be notified. No need to worry about it. If you want to make a backward incompatible change, which you couldn't do up to this point, but now we're giving you the ability to do this, then you have to go and modify the views. So that's, that's basically the way that it works. Yeah, so we have, we have rules that basically detect uh, you know, the, the set of acceptable changes that are backward compatible and those that aren't. Oh, sorry. Like your CI/CD project would launch the second version, the the major version change, right? And keep it up, and you have both running in production for a long time. True. And then if you make another one, it's a third, and then at some point you have to manually kill the older ones. So right, right, great. right. So, um, so that's another aspect of the uh, development tool chain that we leverage. So, uh, multi product gives you the ability to. One interesting thing is you can push an upgrade, so you can actually sort of force upgrade other people as long as their tests pass. Um, I should have mentioned, and this is sort of an important point, so 
you know, we give you the ability to publish multiple versions of the same view at any given point in time, which is the, the point that you're raising. Uh, and then multi-product also gives you the ability to deprecate old versions. Uh, and then that sort of puts people on notice uh, that they need to uh, upgrade and it gives them a window of time in which to do that. And this also goes back to leveraging a process, right? People um, have already accepted the fact that like, it's okay to set a timeline for migrating off of an old API. Uh, and by adopting that existing process, we don't have to uh, you know, socialize and get acceptance uh, for this idea you know, in this other sort of separate world. It's only ex expensive for the materialized views, right? I mean, for the typical temporary views, it's not expensive to have three major version changes of your API at the same time. Uh, it's not expensive in a, in a processing or storage context. I think it's expensive in a maintenance context. Uh, you really don't want to um, allow multiple versions or multiple like uh, major versions of the same view to exist for too long, right? Uh, because um, there may be other changes, let's say in the underlying data set, which would then require you to make changes in all of the different currently published major versions of a view. So it's in the interest of the producer uh, to basically uh, limit the number of major versions at any given point in time and actually reinforce that you can only have two uh, major versions published at a time. Yep. Uh, who actually authors the consumer views? Is it some sort of a business function or is it the data platform? Right, right. So, so uh, good question. So one of the things I didn't really go over in this presentation is that we have different layers of views. Uh, so you could think of the, um, the producer views, which are owned by the online data producers as being the, um, the, you know, the, the fact uh, data sets, right? And then we have derived data sets, uh, which also have their own uh, view public APIs on top of them. We refer to those as consumer views. Uh, and those are typically owned by the same teams that create derived data sets uh, offline. So a lot of the machine learning and relevance teams uh, own consumer views. Uh, the data warehouse team, uh, which is, you know, the team responsible for, you know, creating and sort of curating the catalog of data sets, like saying, mm, you know, it looks like this new derived data set would solve a lot of problems. Let's go create it. They also own a lot of uh, consumer views. Yep. Um, do you have established way of migrating the actual data? So, for example, like you have a terabyte of data. Mm -hmm. uh, you figured out that there's a better way to store or like uh, there's a way to add the fields and such. So basically you evolve the schema. At the same time, you have a view. So uh, I can imagine that it's actually possible to uh, migrate the actual data. Say you do migration, you run some kind of jobs which migrate like for like, data from basically from old way of storing to a new way. At the same time, you have a view which allows the same kind of let's say view one, view two, which allows a view from both versions of actual data. Yeah. So do you have anything like this basically or, or something like a similar process? So what is the way to migrate the data? And uh, you, I mean, overall you, there were, were two statements. One was like, it's super hard actually to do a migration uh, and you normally don't do it. Instead you do like the, uh, another view. Right. So yeah. You know, no, that's, that's a great question. And I think, you know, another sort of point to the one that you're making is, that uh, you do pay a cost every time you execute the view, right? That's a little bit of additional computation, although generally speaking, they're very lightweight. So it is sort of cost-wise in our interest to uh, get everyone migrated over to the point where the, the new schema is basically provided through a pass-through view, which just uh, reads from the underlying data set with the same schema. Um, so doing that uh, atomic switch is something that we are still working on, uh, and I think one of the things that I wrestle with is that um, I like the idea that views once published are immutable, right? That version 1.1.1 is always going to be the same thing. Uh, and I worry a little bit about changing it suddenly uh, to be something else. Um, on the other hand, though, a lot of other people have, I think, managed to convince me that as long as it still satisfies the API, uh, the contract with the consumer, it shouldn't matter. So making these, these atomic changes uh, you know, would be, you know, in our interest. So that's one of the things that we're looking into. Um, another sort of related thing, right, is uh, how you manage cases where you want to um, migrate, let's say, from one format to another format. So we're in the process right now of migrating from Avro to ORC. Uh, since we haven't yet completed the migration of people from 
uh, all of their other like reader APIs over to Dolly, uh, we still had this issue that if we were to overnight convert everything from Avro to ORC, a lot of workflows would break. Um, but we do want to like start allowing people to benefit from ORC immediately, especially if they have the ability to read it. So, um, and then another complicating factor is that we don't have enough space on HDFS to maintain two copies of everything, one in ORC and one in Avro. So after observing that like 90% of jobs basically only look at the last 30 days of data, uh, we realized that we could create basically a copy in ORC and an Avro of the last 30 days and then maintain uh, 30 days plus going backwards in time only in Avro. And then we created views, which basically, um, you know, union together the ORC part with the Avro part uh, extending past 30 days. So if you're using Dolly, uh, you get the best of both worlds. Uh, uh, and also you're able to migrate right now. And then once we switch everything over, you'll get an even better world. Uh, where things are more optimized. But that, that's a great question about you know, how to do the switch over. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you have one Git repo for all of them, or does every team maintain their own Git repos for each? So uh, we, um, we have one Git repo for what we call the Dolly UDFs. Uh, and the, the main motivation for that is that we, um, we're really worried that people who, let me put it this way, uh, we would frequently see people filing JIRAs saying Dolly is broken uh, because they were getting a runtime exception when trying to query a view. But the problem was someone had written a janky UDF, uh, which they hadn't tested and which was breaking. Uh, so we didn't want the good name of Dolly to be impugned uh, by people uh, mistaking you know, one thing for the other. Uh, and I'm, I'm like you know, an amateur public relations person, so I decided you know, we would solve this problem uh, by creating our own curated repository uh, and encouraging people to use that. And then also get really aggressive about going on a journey saying, this is not a Dolly problem, this is your problem, uh, you know, changing uh, Jira summaries and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, but, but really, I mean, the, the goal in the end is to not force everyone to use the same repo. Um, and to, you know, just, uh, I think, also provide um, better craftsmanship guidelines and better testing mechanisms uh, for, you know, writing UDFs. I actually think this is related to another sort of interesting thing. There, there are, in some cases, things that you could express either as a UDF or as potentially a SQL macro. Uh, and the SQL macro approach has, I think, a lot of benefits because uh, you eliminate the possibility of runtime exceptions. With compiled code, I think there's always that possibility, right? That it's going to trigger some code path that none of your tests did. Uh, and, and you'll get some error, which uh, with the the type safety that you get in SQL, you wouldn't have to worry about otherwise. The data sets, the, the view definitions live in different repos. Yeah. Right, because they, there has to be one owner of it that would merge the PRs. Exactly, well. yeah. And, and then I think another sort of issue related to that that we're working with is how do you manage the namespace of views? So right now, we enforce this mechanism where the name of the multi-product or of the Git repository, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between that and the database and the meta store that the views are defined in. But people hate this uh, because um, you know, their friend or their team already has a repository. It's just more convenient to throw it in there, but they'd like it to live in this different namespace. Um, so our plan now is to actually create a single Git repository, which basically represents the namespace of Dolly views and then have uh, files and directories in there, which then point uh, to the multi-products or the Git repositories where the view is actually defined. So this gives you then a single source of truth, a consistent source of truth for the namespace and managing the namespace, and also by leveraging ACLs, uh, which multi-product provides on a per directory basis within a repository, we can assign ownership of those namespaces to individual groups of people. Any other questions? Chris, again, question number two. That's my second this is, the, this is the easy one, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's a little bit related to Sergey's question. Um, you, you're talking mostly about views. Uh, I'm curious to know how materialized views fit into Dolly, if at all. And I mean, one of the things that strikes me is from an optimization perspective, if you start seeing a lot of views that are used heavily, you could materialize it and skip all the processing if it's expensive. 
That's a great question. So um, when we started this project, we were actually sort of thinking about doing things in a different order. Um, like our goal was, um, or the, the original sort of like ordering we thought we would do was uh, sort of focus on uh, workflows as data sets, right? Uh, which also implies basically support for materialized views. Um, but then uh, this big company-wide initiative called Voyager started uh, and you're probably familiar with that, yeah. And um, ISB was part of that along with some other things. And suddenly we found this like, it seemed like Dolly and in particular these select project virtual views were the killer app uh, for solving some big problems there. So we sort of got sidetracked for I think two years uh, building out this uh, view functionality. Uh, and now this quarter, next quarter, we're going to sort of close the loop uh, and start to model tables uh, also as Dolly data sets. So these data sets encompass both uh, materialized views as well as virtual views uh, with the ability to switch uh, back and forth between them. And that's something that the, the infrastructure will determine, right? Depending on space and, you know, a cost function that will attempt to minimize and things like that. Do we have a part three? Okay, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I, I think that's, you know, that, that's my goal, right? Uh, I think right now there are a lot of um, pathologies that emerge because of the tools that we give people to schedule jobs. Like uh, uh, in the absence of being able to specify data dependencies, uh, people specify job dependencies, right? So I want this job to start when this one finishes. Uh, and one thing that we frequently see is that people will create these DAGs uh, where the job dependencies don't actually uh, reflect the actual data dependencies. And it will work 99% of the time because it turns out that this job always finishes before this job, except when it doesn't. And then suddenly the data that it expects to see is not there. Um, another thing is that uh, if you start to think about sort of data dependencies and uh, data scheduling, like you're saying, um, you can then, I, th I think, start to realize that all you really care about is the leaf nodes uh, in your data set tree, right? And it makes then a lot more sense to say, uh, this is the deadline for when this leaf node needs to be ready. And based on historical information you've seen, like if you know that this thing basically always takes eight hours, you can then infer when you need to trigger it. And that should give you a lot more flexibility in terms of how you order jobs, uh, and also potentially the ability to then leverage shared scans or shared joins or things like that. Um, so I think by you know, moving to a more declarative model, uh, moving to one that is sort of more data oriented as opposed to job oriented, a lot of possibilities open up uh, and it becomes a lot easier to think about all of these things. So I, I really think that like we've all been thinking about this the wrong way uh, for the past 10 years and that by sort of, you know, inverting the way we look at it, a lot of things are going to become a lot easier. Yep. Is there a way to uh, release, uh, let's say, alpha version of a view to downstream? Use to say you want to change a small thing in one view and you want just a small percent of the downstream views to use that modified version for testing or whatever purpose. Can you do that in Dolly or there is a way to add it? Good, good question. So you can't do that right now. Um, but I guess one thing that we're, we're working to add is the notion of um, view visibility. Uh, so people can specify that a view is private or protected. Uh, so basically, who should be allowed to depend on it? Uh, and that will allow people then to uh, compose views and have some views basically be part of the implementation, other views be more part of the public API. Um, we're also uh, thinking about um, deployment in the sense that a view would first get deployed to uh, a development cluster or to a, like a, a SOAP cluster. Uh, and once we see um, you know, certain metrics are hit, then it would get nominated uh, and deployed to the actual production cluster. Um, but I like to think personally that uh, a lot of the issues that you see uh, with, I think, more traditional workflows are not really as prevalent uh, with views. So I personally question like how much we need that. Uh, but I've been wrong a lot, so uh, you know we probably do, right? Better safe than sorry. Uh, 
Any other questions? No? Okay, cool. Thanks, everyone. Awesome.